Hello, everyone, and welcome to the program. One of the questions that I receive most often when I'm talking about presidential history, and George Washington in particular, is what was the media like back in the 1790s? Did we have competing sides? Was there a partisan press? How did Washington handle that challenge? And it's a really good question. There are some really interesting parallels, similarities, and also some really important differences. So I'm excited to share a little bit of information with you about the news and the media in the 1790s, how Washington and his successors handled these particular challenges, and then how that has evolved since then and some of the challenges we're dealing with today. All right, let's get started. So in the 1790s, there were a number of different ways that people could get information. They could subscribe to newspapers themselves. They could purchase broadsides. They could purchase books. They regularly exchanged letters with friends and family. And sometimes those letters included clippings from newspapers near them. But there were also a number of ways for people to get news and information if they couldn't afford newspaper subscriptions or if they were illiterate. There was a very defined coffee house culture and a tavern culture that the Americans actually inherited from the British. This process started in London with the rise of coffee houses and places where people could go and converse, share news, read newspapers, and they were often read aloud. So this transferred across the Atlantic, and there were coffee houses in major cities and ports up and down the Atlantic. This one is shown in Philadelphia. It was called the London Coffee House as a nod to where this tradition started. And it also continued into taverns. So, for example, if people were traveling from, let's say, Philadelphia to Boston, along the way, you would have to stay somewhere because those travels took a while, many days, if not weeks. And the most common accommodation was sort of a mix between like a tavern and a bed and breakfast that we would think of today, where there would maybe be a tavern on the first floor and some rooms above that you could rent for the night. Those taverns regularly had newspapers available and people could read them as they traveled to stay on top of the news or go and listen to someone else read them aloud, again, if they couldn't read themselves or they couldn't afford those newspapers. So Americans were definitely on top of what we would consider to be the news. Now, maybe it didn't move as fast as we're accustomed today, and there weren't quite as many options, but they were just as eager to hear what was going on next door, the next city over, and across the Atlantic. In Philadelphia in the 1790s, which is, of course, where Washington spent most of his presidency and where John Adams spent his presidency, there was a very vibrant news culture. There were a series of newspapers, the first of which was the National Gazette, and that was really primarily a pro-administration newspaper, meaning it was very supportive of Washington, and some people actually went so far as to say it was the mouthpiece for Hamilton's financial plans. Now, some people didn't necessarily appreciate this newspaper, and they wanted to have a different perspective. Enter, stage left, Thomas Jefferson and his support for Philip Freneau. Now, as some of you may know, Thomas Jefferson was the first Secretary of State under Washington's administration. And even though he was in the administration, he often disagreed with a lot of the policies and decisions that Washington made. And he was especially annoyed by the National Gazette's support for Alexander Hamilton. So what he decided to do was to hire a uh, editor by the name of Philip Freneau to come and create a new newspaper. Now, newspapers weren't necessarily all that profitable. And so he also hired Freneau as a um, translator in the State Department. Now, the only problem with that, of course, was that Freneau only spoke French. And as the former minister to France, Jefferson didn't need any help with that particular language. Nonetheless, uh, Philip Freneau started his newspaper and began sharing very critical information about the Washington administration, criticizing Hamilton, his role with the financial legislation and his interference in Congress. And he wanted to make sure that Washington saw this criticism. So he actually delivered three copies of his newspaper to the president's house, pictured here, every single day. 
even though Washington didn't have a subscription. And this drove Washington nuts. He complained about it in cabinet meetings. He complained about it to Thomas Jefferson. And he was so frustrated by these newspapers showing up, even though he wasn't paying for them. Now, after For No One Out of Business, a new newspaper started called the Aurora. The, the, that's the picture pictured on the bottom left. The Aurora was run by Benjamin Franklin Bosch, and it was even more critical of the administration. But it definitely borrowed from Freneau's tactics, and he also delivered three copies every single day to the president's house just to get under Washington's skin. Now, you might be thinking, wow, this is some very extreme troll behavior. And you would be right. These are the original 1790s trolls. However, it gets at sort of a broader newspaper culture at the time. There were newspapers that were sort of on what we would think of as maybe the Federalist side. There were newspapers on the Jeffersonian Republican side. And then there were some newspapers like Claypool's Daily Advisor that were more down the middle. They didn't have as clear of a partisan bias. Now, what's really important, and I think the main distinction between today and back then, is that most readers understood where these newspapers fell on the spectrum. So if they wanted more sort of unfiltered, unpartisan news, they would pick up the newspaper sort of down the middle. They would pick up Claypool's Daily Advisor to, rear, to read the straight facts about what was happening in Congress. And then maybe they would also subscribe to a newspaper on one of the other sides, depending on what their political preference was, and read those for that political perspective as well. Now, when we think of this political perspective, it's not quite the same as what we think of today. There were no laws about libel. There were no laws about defamation. There were no laws about what journalists could or could not print. So, for example, one newspaper printed one day that Washington was going to be driving through this town in Delaware. And of course, Washington had no intention of going to this town in Delaware. And he suspected that the newspaper was printing this news so that citizens would show up to see him. And then when he wasn't there, would be disappointed and would hold it against him. And he was infuriated because the newspaper was just lying. He had never announced a trip, but there were no rules or regulations about what the newspapers could or could not print. And this was a constant source of frustration. As I mentioned, when Washington met with his cabinet, which is pictured here, he regularly complained about different reports, different lies, different falsehoods that he read in the papers, and he worried that people would believe them. Usually when they were having those meetings and those conversations, they took place in this room, which is a replica of what Washington's private study would have looked like at the president's house in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, we don't really have um, any depictions of what the space looked like and the house no longer exists. So I've recreated this 3D model just so you can get a sense. And it helps to sort of envision those five guys in this picture seated around the table, chatting about the news, sometimes Washington, you know, expressing his frustration. And you can tell in some of the notes that Jefferson is kind of like trying to hide behind his hand because he knows that he's responsible for some of this support. Now, once Washington retired or announced his retirement, he no longer was the butt of a lot of this criticism because, of course, he had renounced power and had become a private citizen and his reputation really almost became deified with that really monumental choice. And instead, these newspapers turned their focus onto John Adams. At this point, by 1797, when John Adams took office, the political parties, these first two political parties, were beginning to gain strength. They weren't the same sort of operations that we have in the 20th or the 21st century, but we start to see the emergence of political groups and their networks and how they're supporting various candidates. And partisan tensions, partisan conflict in the late 1790s were extreme. The two sides disagreed on foreign policy. They disagreed on domestic policy. They disagreed on who should be the country's closest allies how the president and the vice president should comport themselves, you name it, they basically found something to argue over. And as I mentioned, there weren't any restrictions about what people could say. So oftentimes when we're thinking about John Adams' administration in the press, we think about the Alien and Sedition Acts. And rightfully so, because the Sedition Acts were 
not really in accordance with First Amendment rights, and they were enforced in a particularly partisan way. These laws made it a crime to basically criticize the federal government, and they were enforced against Republican editors. However, I do think some context here is important to understand the motivation behind these bills. So Abigail Adams was with John at the president's house in Philadelphia, and she heard rumors almost every single day that there was going to be arson or mob violence. These rumors would sweep through the city. There were reports of political violence, mobs attacking political figures. One day, one of her servants, one of her maids went out behind the house and in the alleyway found a plan that had been written on a piece of paper and dropped to kill all Federalist leaders. There were no Secret Service officers. There was no gate around the president's house. So people would leave hate mail and threats on the front door of the president's house. And Abigail truly was terrified for the safety and security of her husband, as well as other political leaders. There was a real fear that the political dialogue the lies, the accusations, the falsehoods would lead to civil war. Now, maybe that sounds a little extreme and kind of hyperbolic, but today I think a lot of us do worry about the power of rhetoric to cause violence. And so we can understand maybe where Abigail is coming from, especially at a time when there was no law saying that, you know, you couldn't yell fire in a crowded theater. So anyway, all of this goes to show you both the Sedition Acts, which maybe went way too far, and their fears that the concept of partisan news and fake news and disinformation was very much alive and well in the 1790s. As the decades progressed, news and its role within the political process and the political system only continued to evolve. So this is a picture of what the White House would have looked like when Adams' son was in the White House, John Quincy Adams. And you can see sort of across the street, that main throwaway there, there are a couple little houses. During the uh, Andrew Jackson administration, one of the houses across the street was owned by the Blair family. It's still called the Blair House today, but it was actually owned by the Blair family at that time. And Francis Blair was one of um, Andrew Jackson's closest advisors. In addition to being a close friend, someone that Jackson regularly had dinner with and would spend the evening with the Blair family, Blair was also the editor of a couple of very important newspapers that were very supportive of the Democratic cause. You can see in the cartoon below, there's uh, Andrew Jackson on the right and a much older version of Blair on the left. And they're talking really about the inappropriate relationship between the president's agenda and this newspaper editor. And they weren't totally wrong. Often Jackson would come up with a strategy or a plan. He would go discuss it with Blair, and then Blair would figure out how to craft the news, craft the coverage around this policy to encourage its passage, if it was a, a piece of legislation, or encourage public support for whatever Jackson decided. So the relationship between political parties and newspapers was alive and well. Now, this, um, this slide is uh, perhaps my favorite because on the right, we have sort of a real example of what a political ad would have looked like. And the one on the left, probably not real 1824 or 1828 language, but I love it so much. I think it's such a great, great campaign ad and I wish that it were real. But just to show you a little bit that newspapers definitely took sides. They definitely had their favorites and they advertised them quite blatantly. So that process, the concept of having newspapers that were tied to political parties, really continued up until the end of the 20th century, well into the early years of the 21st century. And what started to change news as a, as a real concept was the rise of what we call muckraking journalism. They were journalists who usually had a higher education, had been trained to investigate issues, and then use their skills as writers and storytellers to uncover wrongdoing, whether it be political corruption at the local level, when we think of, you know, um, political bosses and political machines, whether it be horrible working conditions for women and children in factories, horrible conditions in food production sites. So when we think of food safety in the progressive era, a lot of that was inspired by muckraking journalism. Natural conservation and conservation of resources was inspired by a number of really important stories. 
And they were often accompanied by very powerful political cartoons that captured some of these ideas. So for example, on the top left, there's a picture of Lady Liberty being encircled by the snake of Monopoly. And the idea behind, of course, attacking monopolies was that they were harmful and unfair to the average citizen. If there wasn't corruption, if excuse me, if there wasn't competition, then places like railroads and iron companies and coal companies could gouge the average consumer. And that wasn't fair and that wasn't um, what one would think of about in terms of liberty. So the rise of muckraking journalism really turned on its head what journalism could be, started to see the creation and the adoption of journalistic programs, um, higher education, colleges formed uh, journalism schools, started to offer classes. And then there was the development of a journalistic ethos. The concept that journalists were supposed to pursue the truth in an unbiased fashion. They weren't really supposed to share their own personal opinions. They were supposed to present the facts to the American people. And that concept of a journalistic ethos became very powerful in the 20th century. In fact, such that some of the most trusted figures in public life were some of the big news anchors, names that I'm sure you're familiar with, like Ed Murrow, Walter Cronkite, and even Dan Rather. Now, these were names and faces that most Americans could identify. At the time, there were only a couple of TV channels, and when these guys showed up every night, you really developed a relationship or rapport with them, an ability to trust what they were saying. And frankly, for good reason, because they were pursuing this journalistic ethos of presenting the truth, presenting the facts, pursuing important stories, but in a non-political way. They didn't tend to show their perspective. So that was really the state of affairs until the proliferation of a multiple different TV programs. Once there started to be more options, then there started to, again, be this diverse um, perspective on what was shared. And so we start to see things like multiple different TV channels. We start to see more partisan channels. We see, of course, the rise of different types of technology like the internet. And now, of course, we have social media. So I wanted to share these two graphs and statistics because I think that it shows um, how people have changed how they get their information, how they get their news. And it's quite different than it used to be. So way back when, it used to be primarily newspapers. Then with the invention of the radio, radio became a very important source. Then with the invention of the television, you had the TV. And now we have social media. And you can see based on these graphs that the internet and social media is by far and away the most popular way for people to get news, which in theory is not a bad thing. That's actually a democratization of information and access, which is positive in some ways. It's great that more people have access to more stories. We can hear from more voices. There's the opportunity for new talent to make a name for themselves. All things I applaud. The problem is that with that proliferation of platforms and sources and voices, not all actors are operating in the same way. Most people online are not pursuing the journalistic ethos that these guys did. And that is okay. There's no reason that they necessarily don't have to, except that if the viewer doesn't know how to distinguish. So the problem is that we have a lot of people who are reading news online, getting their information from social media, and they are operating under the assumption that the information they are reading and consuming is being created with the same attention and care that it used to be on the television when there were only three channels. And that's very much not the case. This is, while I don't want to paint too broad of a brush, this is a little bit of a generational problem. Um, if we, There have been a lot of studies that have shown that some younger viewers actually are a little bit more savvy about distinguishing good sources from bad because they've grown up with this uh, multifaceted media world. And sometimes older generations have some trouble distinguishing sources from bad because they are used to that journalistic ethos and the reporters that they can trust. So that's understandable. It's a real challenge. Now, I don't want to paint a dire scenario and say that we've never been here before and it's unprecedented because that's not quite so. Every time there has been a new innovation and new technology, whether it be the radio or the telegraph or the telephone or the television, there were always critics that said it was going to be the end of civilization as we know it, that 
things were going to work and society was going to crumble and morals were going to uh, evaporate and the family was going to implode, all of these things. My favorite in particular was the telegraph. There was a concern that it was too fast for the truth. You couldn't have fact-checking if things moved that quickly. Now, of course, the world did continue to turn and we've continued to evolve and societies have survived. So some of those concerns were misplaced. And I do think that some of those concerns are a little bit perhaps um, exaggerated with social media. There are lots of good things that come from the internet and the ability to connect with people. But there are also challenges that we still have to grapple with. There are uh, lots of different sources of misinformation and disinformation. And we as a society haven't quite yet figured out how to wrap our arms around those challenges. They are in some ways quite similar to the ones that Washington and Adams faced. And yet they also present some uh, new challenges because indeed things are moving faster and there is just more information for us to grapple with. So I hope that was a helpful sort of intro to presidents, the news, and how we handle those pieces of information. I'd be happy to answer questions. I'll, I will keep an eye on the comments and on social media. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can find me on most social media channels. My handle is LM Chervinsky, or you can um, read any of my other work and my writing at my website, which is lindsaytravinsky.com. Even if you misspell it, that's okay. There's only one of me, so it's pretty easy to find um, on Google. Thank you again for tuning in. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.